I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you. Hi everyone, I'm Jason Ballara and this is the Know Your Why podcast. Today I'm here with Chad Zdenek. Chad is the founder and CEO of CSQ Properties. Uh, He is a rocket scientist turned entrepreneur turned real estate guru. Um, As I mentioned before we started recording, rocket scientist is, is a first on the show, so pretty cool um first of all first of all chad thanks for thanks for coming on the show today thanks for taking time out you bet excited to be here thanks jason awesome well let's just start uh with with your story your background obviously even in that <laughs> short intro there's a lot of uh interesting uh, i'm sure career transitions and things like that so so maybe just tell us a bit of your story and then we'll we'll dive in from there cool yeah you bet I, so i've had kind of three distinct careers uh, so far. And yeah, technically, I did start out as a rocket scientist. I was working for a rocket line on the space shuttle main engines as a uh, structural dynamics engineer. So my background is in structural engineering. And I did that for uh, for seven years. Uh, loved it. Super technical, but definitely a bit too bureaucratic for me. I'm definitely an entrepreneur at, at heart. I've uh, either founded or helped found seven different companies and just love the the entrepreneurial mindset. I'm sure we'll be talking about mindset a bit on the, on the show. Um, I love that. And it so drove me to uh, join my brother in a startup, which was a, uh, a lighting business focusing on Christmas lighting of all things. And uh, so it was a big departure from, from the rocket scientist work I was doing but definitely fueled my my entrepreneurial aspirations. And uh, when we started, it was just uh, you know him, my sister, and a few workers. And I was getting my MBA at UCLA at the time, and uh, and and used his company kind of as a a pet project of mine because I was focusing on entrepreneurial studies. And then it grew to a size to where he really wanted me to come across and help grow up more. And uh, so believe it or not, I actually took a 50% pay cut to go work with him. Uh, He gave me 50% of the business and paid me or promised to pay me more than he was paying himself. So it was like really, really big compromise on both our parts. Uh, But we got to work and uh, eventually over the next 15 years, grew that to be a 75 person company with three different warehouses and basically became the, the largest Christmas lighting business in uh, LA. And we also did wedding lighting and, and landscape lighting and stuff like that. But uh, very seasonal, worked a ton of hours for half the year. The other half of the year had quite a bit more flexibility. Um, but I'd always wanted to, I say, get back into real estate because I I, I didn't mention a, a stint I had in construction management for two years, got my contractor's license saw a lot of the transaction, you know, construction side of business, of real estate rather. And uh, so then started investing in 2015 on my own. And then my brother bought me out of the company in 2018. And I went into uh, syndications full time. Um, Imagine your audience knows that, knows what a syndicator is, but I'm a real estate syndicator, a lot like what you do. And and I started doing that in uh, 2018. Initially in California, which which comes with its own challenges, and then uh, and then now I partner on on much larger deals uh, out of state with with other people, uh, and that's what I do with with uh, CSQ Properties. You can see behind me the name of the company, and uh, so we invest primarily in multifamily and self storage projects um, in North Carolina, Florida, and Texas. Okay, great. Um... I'm really curious about this Christmas lighting business. Just the, uh, it, it, this is you're essentially decorating people's houses. Is that kind of the, where the, the business was the process? Or were you creating lighting or, cause I know you have an engineering background. So I'm just kind of curious what, what the process was. 
Sure. So it was basically a, an installation service and removal company. We started out working on like large houses. We would say people that bought too big of a house and too small of a ladder. Uh, but I mean, look, you're you're in LA as well. You know, we've got a lot of mega mansions out here. So we did a lot of large houses. Um, largest house was 52,000 square foot house. Oh, wow. uh, but then we also did commercial projects like uh, Universal Studios, the Forum, the Greek Theater, um, the City of Beverly Hills. I'm sure you're familiar with the, the Americana brand and the Grove. Yeah. Yeah. So like all those projects um, were the, the lighting projects that we did. And we also did properties down to San Diego, up to Santa Barbara. But our, our primary focus was L.A. Yeah. Wow. That, I mean, that the, the the Americana has lighting. I mean, it's very elaborate. I can imagine all of those things. I mean, that, that must have been, as you said, you must have been working like crazy from, I don't know, October through uh, January or February between installation yeah. and, and um, removal. It's it's crazy. But it's a it's I'm always fascinated by. A lot of people that have come on the podcast, like the vast majority come from, you know, sort of what seems like an unrelated uh, career path prior to getting into real estate, you know, as a, as a rocket scientist, uh, lighting installation. I mean, you would say people would probably say, well, that's that's not a real estate investing. But I think oftentimes there's skill sets, certain skill sets, depending on what the background is that have that translate and that help you. Uh, as you move into real estate and and maybe depending on what that background is it it translates to certain areas of of whether it's you know syndication or whatever part of real estate investing so how do you feel like your background sort of prepared you or steered you towards you know uh syndications yeah that's a good point and i agree with you 100 percent. i mean there's so many different backgrounds that can lend itself well into real estate and i think part of the reason is because real estate's a really really broad sector right yeah. there's so many different aspects of real estate that you can be a part of so for me personally uh i'm a structural engineer um i also did like structural design for custom homes and houses here in la seismic design so like i'm very familiar with the building codes I'm also a general contractor, so the building side of it I know really well. So those obviously are super helpful within real estate. Um, I also, you know, focus on Class B, Class C value add deals. So we buy older buildings and fix them up, uh, improve the properties, and then bring those rents to market. So that there's a lot of construction involved with that. Um, so so that's kind of like the nuts and bolts of background that applies, but from like a, a mindset standpoint, you know, being an engineer, like we all know engineers, they, they think a certain way. And, uh, you know, we tend to be very methodical and logical and we can analyze issues and problems and stuff like that. And and that serves as a, as a good background for a lot of different things. Well, in real estate, there's a lot of risk mitigation that you need to do, right? So, mm -hmm. You know, it's not as simple as saying, oh, I just want the biggest return, right? You, you've got to add the element of risk to it. And um, and so when you do that, especially when you're talking about real estate, it, it's a lot different than like analyzing the risk of a company or a stock or something like that. Um, because real estate, especially on the construction side, there's just a, there's a lot of moving parts. And these moving parts have different elements of risk associated with it. So I find myself as an engineer analyzing those risks a lot to find the best the best risk adjusted returns I can get mm -hmm. and that's a lot different than just looking at the best returns. So uh so that background has served pretty helpful for me in evaluating things. And and the last piece I'd probably add to that is the entrepreneurial part of it. And and this was kind of a surprise to me like it was easy for me to see real estate and construction and that sort of stuff, engineering, how it all related. But I didn't really appreciate how much entrepreneurial spirit there could be within a real estate company. Um, but now I see it, right? I mean, I started my business and I've got, you know, cash flow issues. I've got HR issues. I've got legal issues, right? There's all the same sort of issues that you might have in any sort of business you have in a, in a real estate business. And for me, I really like that that part of it. I say issues, but but for me, they're really just like challenges. Mm -hmm. And um, and we'll probably talk about this on the show, but like my why is to find a better way. 
And I can do that in any sort of aspect of business. And for me, that's really rewarding to do. Um, you know, I really probably shouldn't call them issues or challenges because they're they're fun things to work on, right? I like improving those things as part of the business. Yeah, it, it's, uh, I, I think at the root of it, that's that's what being an entrepreneur is, is a problem solver, right? So you have, you know, and, and people, I think a lot of people maybe out, outside of that don't necessarily run a business or aren't entrepreneurial. Maybe, you know, they, they see, you, you, we use the words problems, issues, challenges, whatever it is. But it's funny because to, to the people inside the space, we almost say that like it's a good thing, right? It's like, I, I, like, <laughs> I like solving problems. I like finding, because that's the reality of business is that there will be challenges. There will be issues. There will be things to learn from. And then, you know, sort of, as you said, like build that better way. So you're, you take them and, and turn them into positives. And, and I think that, you know, maybe for people listening, they might hear you say those things and, and they might be think, well, that's, that's why I don't want to own a business or get into real estate. And it's, that's fine. But, but what you find out is, is that's a little bit of the, of the fun of it, right? Because you do have to have that analytical side, as, as you mentioned, right? You're, you're looking at, um, you know, putting the best systems in place, the best processes, you're looking at your risk adjusted returns. And, but regardless of how, you know, sort of perfect, you may try to construct it, things are still going to come up. And, you know, because at the end of the day, business involves people, and people have personalities, there's things that will be unpredictable. And so it's just kind of bringing it all together. So I think that that's, um, you know, that, that topic of, you know, these problems or challenges and, and even hearing you kind of not want to call them that because it, it, that it, those words imply negative, but, but I don't think, I don't think we necessarily always see them as negative. It's, it's, it's more just a part of business. Yeah, I agree. I mean, look, these challenges present opportunities, right? If you right. can help solve problems and solve other people's problems, that brings value to the market and you get rewarded for that. So, that's um you know they're they're they you might be solving problems but but for me i enjoy those things i know a lot of entrepreneurs do um i like juggling a bunch of different things and and so you know running a, a business allows me to do that and it for me it's always been really rewarding uh, as an entrepreneur yeah yeah for sure um i wanted to touch on you know you sort of mentioned those risk adjusted returns and and you know, sort of people always looking for what is the biggest return. And th those are kind of important concepts, I think, for people to understand, because one, you look at, you know, are you, are you talking about this from an active standpoint as an active investor, or are you talking about it from a, a passive investor? And so both of those, you know, sort of different camps may look at uh, the risk differently. Um, I think it may be helpful to mention if you look at you know, say the the family offices, the the you know sort of high net worth individuals, and what they're investing in, they're they're actually willing to take a much lower return because when they're especially when they're investing passively because of the that you know lower risk, and so it's it's you know it's a balance. I think it's a balance on both the active and passive side, but I do think sometimes you know people uh, will be presented a deal. And they're just looking for the return metrics to be as high as possible, maybe not recognizing that the, the reason why they're higher is be, because of that risk. And so you have to, you know, sort of take all of that into account. How do you, how do you balance it? How do you, when you're trying to find that sort of sweet spot of, of risk versus reward, what is your thought process on that? Yeah, and that's a good question. And, and I think it really does span the full spectrum. And, and for me, I kind of look at it from an investor standpoint, where are you on your journey? Are you on a, a wealth accumulation phase, meaning you're, you're building up your wealth? Are you or are you at a wealth preservation phase where you already have a lot of wealth and you're trying to preserve it? You know, you've got a lot of very, very sophisticated family offices and institutional investors and, and companies that are fine with a smaller return because they're in their wealth pres preservation mode, right? They already have the wealth, they have the money. To them, it's more important not to lose it, right? 
kind of goes back to Warren Buffett's, you know, top two rules of investing. One, never lose money. And two, don't ever forget rule number one. Right. So, you know, there's something to be said for that. But but that's different than a, an investor who might be in the wealth accumulation phase. Maybe they're younger. Maybe they're willing to take more risk to try to get those higher returns. And those are just two different types of investors. And um, and and there's a whole spectrum of everything in between. So so for me personally, um, since and you you at Lark, you're you guys are probably the same. But we try to have a variety of different investments for different investors. Like we still have like kind of our niche, but it there's a, a spectrum within that niche, right? And um, and so for me personally, since I invest in all these deals myself, like I want to have a diversified portfolio of properties. And, and I will, I will kind of go in between that, that, um, uh, that spectrum, if you will. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So like right now I've got uh, two, two different deals that I'm, that I'm offering. And one is like a class A, you know, um, class A apartment building in a downtown, you know, district, right. Dallas, like a really class A great market. And um, a little bit lower returns because there's not as much risk there, right? There's some value add to it. So that's going to help when the returns, but you could say a lower risk profile. Whereas I'm also doing in a, a secondary or maybe even tertiary market uh, in Alabama, a self-storage project. And and that's, you know, a, a totally different animal than, you know, multifamily in, in a downtown core. Um, now those are going to have two different risk profiles associated with it. I'm going to have two different types of investors that are generally looking at each of those. And, but for me personally, I'm willing to do both because it helps to me, they, they help diversify the portfolio I'm offering and I'll have investors that will think the same way and they'll end up investing in both. Um, but the idea is that I think it's helpful to, to be in different asset classes to be in different geographical locations and really try to spread out some of that risk. Um, you know, I mean, there's something to be said. You've got some people that are say, hey, I'm the expert in this area and this is all I do. But sometimes you can have some external forces that can affect that area. And, and you're going to be really exposed if something happens in that area or in that asset class. Um, I mean, you and I living in California, we know what some of that exposure can look like. And, uh, and that was the premise for me wanting to begin investing out of California. And now I do both, but um, I think you're, you're kind of exposing yourself a bit much if you're only hyper-focused in one area or one asset class. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you, you know, you, you sort of mentioned the, the California thing, and, and I think it's worth talking about because there's, you know, you, you're also investing in the... I don't know, I guess the, and it's same, you know, that, that sort of Southeast Texas, the, the areas that people consider sort of the, the ideal, you know, sort of landlord friendly areas um, that, that everybody talks about is this is where you should invest. And then, you know, lots of people will, will um, <laughs> disparage California as a place to invest in it. And, and a lot of that has to do with just the, the landlord tenant laws and the, um sort of way that that's treated and, and things like rent control. But um, I, I want to hear kind of your take on why you invest here. And I, I, I sort of, I, you touched on why you invest other places. I, I completely agree with the diversification angle, but what is it, what's appealing about uh, investing here in California as well? So I think part of that goes back to my journey as I kind of came up through the ranks of of being a syndicator and getting more and more into real estate. And I'm sure a lot of your listeners can can appreciate this. Like you feel more comfortable investing where you live, right? So when you're just starting out, you know the area, you've been there a long time, you know to invest on you know this side of the street, but not that side. And and you, so it, it helps reduce that risk, if you will, on on or improve your your comfort level. At, uh, for that particular investment. So I was just like that, right? I, I've grown up in LA my whole life. And uh, so I wanted to do my investments close to home. And, and that's how I started. Um, I did have kind of a unique, I guess, start because I started out as a solo syndicator, solo GP. 
which is kind of rare for your first deals. Most people will partner with other more experienced people. Uh, I didn't do it that way. I just, I did my own deals, uh, but I had a, a strong engineering background, strong construction background. I had my MBA, um, contractor's license. So I had like a lot of the, the tools in the tool belt, tool belt, if you will. So I did my, all my first deals were all on my own. Um, and then I started doing larger deals with other people. But going back to your original question, like I knew LA and, and so that's where I started to invest. Um, that being said, there's a lot of legislative liability, if you will, that you know it can be passed down the down from in here from from Sacramento, and it's really hard to kind of underwrite to those sort of things. And um, you know, I I call those you know legislative liabilities or legal minefields, and the landscape is always changing, which makes it really difficult to, to operate. The good news is this is LA. We've got great weather. It's a beautiful place. You know, people want to live here. Uh, it's it's obviously a, a primary market. So there's a lot of pluses in that regard. Um, your cash flows are generally a little tighter, but uh, or lower. Uh, but appreciation is always really good, right? It's right. it's LA. It's tried and true. Now, if you add a, a value add component to it, where you're buying an old building and fixing it up. That can help increase cash flows, and that was what my approach was. And um, you know, we've been doing five to seven percent cash on cash returns uh, investing here in SoCal. So uh, those are still really good returns, but you got to have a value add component in order to do that, right? You can't buy it. You can't do that with any stabilized deals. You might have, um, you know, be buying like a I don't know two or three percent cash on cash returns. Um, if it's a, a stabilized deal here. So anyway, so th that was my approach. And then um, I, I quickly started investing outside of California, making sure there's partners that I knew, liked and trusted. And, um, and, and that's where the bulk of my investments are today. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think the sort of almost like bringing together two things that you said, one, you know, you have some of those legal minefields that, that you might run into here in California, it's which is true, and things can change. But at the same time, I would say you you kind of know what you're up against, right? So you you kind of know what you're up against here in California. You're you if you can find those value add opportunities, I think they're good. I think you you mentioned kind of in in some of the other markets, or you, you mentioned the, the possible of possibility of a shift in markets or sentiment, things like that. If, you, if you're looking at some of those common areas like Texas, Florida, uh, you know, that, that whole Gulf Coast area, one of the things that a lot of operators are dealing with right now is that the cost of insurance has skyrocketed. So what used to be like a favorable deal, the sky, the, the cost of insurance go way up, then it becomes, um, it, it takes away a lot of that cash flow. So you, you could, you could make the case sometimes that uh, as long as nothing changes, great. But if you if if things are going to change dramatically like that, then it's almost better to like know what you're up against right from the beginning. Um, so it, it's the, I, my point being that you have to look at what your investment thesis is, and so if you're if you're looking strictly for cash flow probably don't want to invest in California. It's probably not the way to go. But if you're, as you mentioned earlier, like in that wealth accumulation phase, there's very good appreciation here. So you can have, uh, you know, the, the value of a property is probably going to double in five years. You're going to have, so you're going to have that, that strong appreciation maybe better than you might in some of the cash flow markets. So it's just, I, I think it's just being very uh, conscious of what you what you actually want, what you're trying to get out of it. And as you mentioned, you know, diversification is the way to get you sort of the most, the best of all those worlds, kind of put it all together. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, you bring up a good point about insurance, right? Because that's something that people didn't really see happening. You know, you might have had a I don't know five percent increase on insurance or something like that in original underwriting. And now you're seeing 50% and 100% increases on insurance. So, you know, one point like to piggyback on that is, is there's no such thing as a perfect deal. There's always right. issues that come up, right? You yeah. just, you don't know what they're going to be, but there's always issues. 
doesn't matter where you're investing. And so the question is, you know, are you part of a team that's got the experience and, and knowledge to deal with those issues as they come up? And that's really why I think I think it's more important for investors to look at at their partnership team more mm -hmm. even more so than the asset, right? I mean that because there's going to be issues, right? The asset might look great on day one, but later on there's going to be issues, and who's going to fix that? It's going to be the partnership team. They're the ones that are going to have to navigate that storm, whatever it might be, and that's where experience uh, really really comes into play. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. You know the, these. Uh... The years prior to, you know, the 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 shift in the market, it, operations maybe weren't as vitally important as they are now. But but yeah, now that you know, sort of the operations team, you know, people like yourself that have a, a construction background and knowledge and can can you know, sort of intelligently address these problems uh, along with your you know property management group. It, it's kind of the, the team and the functionality of that has become even more important than it was, you know, over the last few years when the market was, was in a, you know, up cycle. So it's just a matter of, of recognizing that there will be problems building in some contingency for that. And, you know, sort of, you know, you can't, I guess, prepare for everything that could possibly happen, but kind of understanding, uh, Hey, something's going to happen. So we better have some reserves. We better have some, you know, plan B and C on, on our um, value add strategy, you might want to have multiple exit op options. So I think that's just having all of that together and not just thinking, okay, I'm going to have, you know, the, the rents are going to go up at this exact amount. The expenses are going to go up at this exact amount. It's just, it's just not going to likely be uh, where everything falls into place the way that you hope it does. But if you've built in that cushion, then then it'll be fine, and you can still have a, a you know good performance within that deal. Um, Chad, I, I want to switch gears here so I can ask you the questions that I like to ask every guest. Uh, first one is you touched on it, but relating to the name of the show being "Know Your Why." Um, what is your why? And I, I want to kind of dig into this a little bit as well. Yeah, so good question. Um, and it took me a while to get there. I actually hired a, a, like a business life coach to help me find my why. So when I when I knew I was going to be exiting the lighting business, I didn't know for sure. Like, well, early on, like I didn't know what I would end up doing. Right, mm -hmm. real estate was a very strong pull for me. So it was like, okay, likely I'm going to go into real estate, um, but. I kind of wanted to do a kind of double check that that's really what I wanted to do. I had a, a year and a half transition out of that company. So I had some time to figure out my next steps. And then, uh, so for me, I went back to finding my why, right? I, we've heard a lot about, you know, the importance of that over time. Um, for me, I'd been pretty successful in some areas of my life. And I, I was thinking that this third phase would probably be my last career switch. And uh, so I really wanted to spend time to figure that out. So I hired a, a guy to help me within uh, the entrepreneurs organization, which I, I've been a part of for 10 years and, uh, and just met with him every week to do it. And that's kind of his specialty. And um, we went through this course, uh, this journey, if you will, of discovery, right? And uh, part of it was um, Simon Sinek's book, um, uh, Know Your, what is it? Simon Sinek's? Start with why, it's by Simon mm -hmm. Sinek, right? It's a great book, and um, so I took about six or seven months to dive into this, and eventually I found out that for me, my uh, my why is to find a better way, and and how do I do that? I do that by mastering things. I like to learn. I'm a, a lifelong student. I've got three master's degrees. It's just been something I've always done. And so, what do I do with that? Is I challenge the status quo. Hence CSQ. So like that is how my company name came to be. But at the core of it is to find a better way. And um, and I found that th like that's just what I do naturally. Like I, there's no way I can do anything else but find a better way, which drives my wife crazy sometimes. I mean, <laughs> even my kids, because like it's almost like nothing's ever good enough because you always want to try to improve, right? Self-improvement. Yeah. But to me, that's just at the core of who I am. So once I knew that, then I said, okay, how can I find a better way and apply that in real estate, right? 
So for me, that's just st- challenging the status quo. And um, and it doesn't necessarily need to be like market disruptive, right? I'm not talking necessarily like Elon Musk, big idea type of stuff. But for me, it's like challenging my own status quo, right? Like, like okay, where am I at today? And how can I improve tomorrow? Like, like shake that up today to improve myself and then find a better way. And that's what I just do every single day. I'm just, I, I, it keeps me up at night. That's, that's all I do. That's how I operate. And uh, so for me, I just began to embrace it. And I, I do that in real estate, always trying to improve things. And and that that's my why. That's my endless endless energy for that. Yeah. I, I mean, I love that. I think that that is probably a lot, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, they want to find a better way to do things. But I, I do think it's needed because, you know, one of my... I really hate when people say, you know, the answer to a question, the answer to like, why do you do it this way is because this is how we've always done it. Or, you know, or, or I've been doing it this way for this long and it's worked just fine. And I'm just like, that, that's like the mo- one of the most infuriating answers. So I, I love that idea of, you know, just going to keep looking for that better way. It, it's like, it's so, it's a silly example, but you know, when people say that and I'm like, well, do you have an iPhone? Because you used to use a rotary phone probably. So like, yeah. it, it's just like, sometimes people are willing to accept that change and, and improvement of technology or processes or whatever it is. But then sometimes they get stuck in their own. I don't know if you're, you're in your head or whatever it is, but you're like, this is just how I've done it. So I love, mm-hmm. I love the idea of, you know, sort of questioning how things are done and, and, you know, looking for a, a better way to do it. I think, I think that's fantastic. And like a, a also a really great motivator and keeps things interesting. Right. Like if you're always it's you don't have to just you're not going to get bored because you're like, well, I'm looking for the better way to do this. You know, how can we improve on these processes? So um, mm-hmm. really cool. Um, second question for you, Chad, t- tell us something about yourself that that uh, isn't common knowledge, special skill, a hobby, just something to let the listeners know you a little bit better. Uh, sure. So so I'm a, an endurance athlete junkie. Uh, five-time Ironman finisher, uh, ultra marathon runner. So for me, that's that's uh, something I've always done to help clear my head and kind of get in the zone, do some really deep thinking. So I, I tend to push myself pretty hard on on the athletic side of things. Uh, I also have five kids, so <laughs> in order to so get some busy quiet, I got to run pretty far away. Yeah, you got to. <laughs> I I need to go run for several hours to get away from you guys. That's yeah. 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 I uh I get it. I I um have you ever done uh like the obstacle races, the tough mutter, mm-hmm. Spartan races, those sorts of things. Yep. I love those. I get I get bored with I I've run marathons and things, but I just I like the race. I don't like the training. I don't like just running and running for without yep. like a thing. But when I discovered those um you know, kind of obstacle type races. I think that's a blast. It just breaks up the, breaks up the running with something, uh, you know, some other activity in the middle of it. So, sure. uh, but I agree with you. I think, you know, getting out and, and being active is, is uh, to me as much, it keeps me physically well, as much as mentally well in terms of um, dealing with, you know, the, the challenges that come in business and entrepreneurship and having a family and sort of balancing it all. Um, when people hear this and they want to reach out to you, what's the best way? Yeah, so the best way is probably uh, either the website is just uh, csqproperties.com or any social media channels just at CSQ Properties, Instagram, Facebook. You can find me personally, LinkedIn, Chad Zdenek. Um, yeah, that'd be the best way. Okay, good. We'll put that stuff in the in the show notes. Um, final question for you, Chad. What piece of advice would you give to someone who is getting started in real estate, they want to, you know, kind of hear this, this episode, they want to follow in your footsteps, you know, kind of do, do big things. What would you tell them to get them started on the right foot? So good question. I'll share something that I learned pretty late in life, actually. And I, it's one of my regrets. It's something that can be used, whether you're just starting out or whether you're a seasoned veteran, um, if you haven't done it already. And that is really to to network a lot more and uh, join mastermind groups and hire mentors. So like like those three things, uh, I was a slow learner on. Obviously, I, I've done a lot of formal education. I always want to learn everything myself. But that's like the long, hard way to do it. 
if you if you look at joining these mastermind groups or going to conferences and networking, like you can really accelerate that timeline to, of learning. And uh, and I was late in life. I was in my 40s when I finally started doing that. And I wish I would have started that earlier. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, it's still I I, I think I'm, I feel like I'm still learning it. But the, the best way to network and and sort of get around you, you just it the you know some of the I think cliches are cliches because usually there's there's some a fair bit of truth to them. But it's just getting getting in rooms with people, you know, you, you want to be the, you don't want to be the smartest person in the room. You want to want to get in there and, and, uh, you know, be around people that have, have done what you're trying to do They're you know, maybe a few steps ahead of you and, and have that, um, knowledge and, and just, uh, I guess <laughs> proof of concept, you know, that, mm-hmm. that, that what you're trying to do isn't, isn't, uh, isn't crazy, isn't impossible. And, and then you do it, you know, you see that, and then you can translate that to, to, doing it the way that, that you want to do it. So, um, I think that's great advice. Uh, and I would just like to say, thank you. Thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you for taking the time out, sharing your story. Um, really appreciate it. I think the the listeners will, will, um, get a lot of value out of, you know, hearing your journey. So, so thank you very much for your time. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey without a strong why it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you.